you so much. Thanks, Eddie. Well, I'm sure there'll be plenty of time this evening to check out the amazing books as well as clothes that you see around you. But first, we are going to have a, a conversation. Um, and today's conversation, as you all know, is about the past, present, and future of this space. Um, and we have three wonderful panelists here to share with us. The first um, person who is going to be sharing this afternoon um, will be Lai Chi Ken, um, who is an architectural and urban historian, the vice president of the Asian Society of Architectural History, right? Yeah. Architectural historians, that's right. Um, and I first got to know Chi Ken through his book on early hawkers in Singapore. Um, so since then, I've sort of been following Chi Ken's work, and he's here to tell us a little bit about the history of the neighborhood and how Peace Center fits into that. So over to you, Chi Ken. Thanks. Thank you, Thank you for uh, Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, there's, there's a lot to talk about, uh, but uh, in, in the space that I've been given, um, I thought I should just talk about uh, two aspects, and then maybe you know, uh, you, you can fill up uh, all the other spaces in between. Um, the first is about, of course, the context of you know, why, we have, you know, why, why there's development here and the sort of long string of history that has uh, brought development right up to this point. Uh, and then, of course, the second is the, uh, the building typology that uh, this was part of, which I think is also quite uh, a, an important aspect to, to talk about. So, the, so, so, so here are two points. Uh, there will be some maps uh, being shown, and wherever they are, sh whenever they are shown, uh, you can look out for this blue dot, which will uh, locate uh, Peace Center. So, so, so the blue dot marks where uh, the Peace Center is. So just to, how do I? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, um, just a bit of the history. This is a, this is a town map of uh, Singapore by G. D. Coleman, who was uh, one of Singapore's first surveyors, architect, and so on and so forth. Uh, in eighteen eighteen thirty six. So this is about fifteen eighteen years uh, after uh, British founded Singapore, uh, and this is this is the um, this is a survey that was done, and. Uh, and this, this area, of course, you know, you, you know some of the features. Uh, and importantly, there are <coughs> four water features, right? So if you look at this, north is roughly this way. There is the Singapore River, right, which, is, which looks like this at that time. Okay? And then on the other side, you have the Kalang River and uh, Rocho, Rocho, well, Rocho River, and then before it was uh, made into a canal. So this, you have the Rocho Canal. And then actually in between these uh, uh, water systems, you have the uh, Stanford Canal. So Stanford Canal actually marks the, the sort of uh, lowest point when uh, passing through, which eventually also became uh, Orchard Road. Right? So whenever I tell people Orchard Road is actually a big long gun, but you have all these uh, hills, uh, Mount, Mount, you know, Mount, uh, Mount, uh, uh, Emerald Hills and you know uh, uh, Scotts Hill and things like that all, all around it. So you have these four features which actually made <coughs> this area very interesting for planners, which they which, which they did in uh, 1822, which was the first town plan, with the very first road that ran uh, right across, right, uh, close to the coast, called uh, North Bridge Road. So this was the very first road, right? Uh, and then, of course, the uh, the British sort of uh, subdivided different uh, race enclaves uh, all around it, right? So you know there are, there are some Chinese enclaves here. You have Kampong Glam, right, which is just further down. Uh, and then, of course, this central area here, right next to the Singapore River, was the uh, civic district uh, that the British had set up. And this area uh, where we are here, right, all the way from the hills to the sea, uh, was a road that they, that they, that they named uh, Middle Road. Right? And the possible reasons for why it's called Middle could be it's the road that runs right through European town. Right? But it could also be because it was uh, sort of like a midpoint between the uh, business area and a uh, couple uh, of here side. Some other, so, so you can see the blue dot here, right? Mount Sophia and Mount Emily behind. But this, uh, this uh, Rocho Canal is actually interesting because it kind of marked the limits of town, 
right? Meaning that if you pass this point, right, you are in so-called the, the, the suburbs, okay? Because when, once you pass this point, you can see that there are, there are brick kilns. Uh, and, and surprise, surprise, right? They used to plant uh, paddy, rice, uh, on, on this side. Right? So there were all these uh, plantations. <coughs> Okay, so the early um, the early, early settlement right um, just after the British uh, arrived, the, you, you can see the various uh, kampongs around. Right? This is um, this is work by uh, a <coughs> colleague of mine, uh, Dr. Imran uh, Takudin. So so here you can see the sort of different rivers. You can see the um, the uh, Kota Raja right, where where the um, where the uh, kampong glam is now right, with with different Different, different ethnic groups. Right? So, so in fact, if this whole shoreline is uh, Bugis town right? because of their, uh, uh, their boats and all that. Behind that is uh, Kampong Dobi, uh, Kampong Serani, which is the uh, Eurasian community. And then you have uh, Kampong Bukuru, right? These are the people who came uh, with Raffles because Raffles was uh, previously stationed in, in the Kulu and they, they came over here. Uh, on the other side, of course, is uh, Kampong Kapo, right? So, so previously we, we, we noted this uh, brick kiln areas. Kapo is the lime uh, lime mortar that is made. So, so between bricks and a lime, right, you could start building building up the the, 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 the Singapore town, right, as it were. And um, so, this is again um, maybe thirty years later after that map, and you can see a much uh, clearer. Uh, Clear a view right of, of the different hills, right? So this this blue dot is here, um, and this this is now uh, uh, Orchard Road, right? Because it is it, it is a water source, right? That's why it's actually quite good for plantations and so on and so forth. So you can you can also see that the hills uh, are beginning to be uh, named. Right? So you have you have Fort Canning here, and then you, of course you have the Government House uh, Istana here on, uh, on on Mount Caroline. The estate that uh, this area uh, belonged to will actually belong to a, a person called Princep, right? which is why we have uh, Princep Street. The hills are sort of named after his uh, family members. Right? It was first thought to be his daughters, but then we found, you know, a, a friend, another friend found out that actually these are all sort of family members. We have Sophia, you have Emily, um, Caroline, where, where the standard is, and then of course there's another small hill called uh, Mount, Mount Louisa. Then there are of course the other hills over here on, on that side. Um, the first um, occupation of uh, the hill was actually recorded right, as early as uh, 1822. Right? So there's, there's a communication uh, by the res uh, British resident, William Farquhar, saying that you know, um, when, when, the, when the British arrived, they really found that there were some uh, Chinese Gambia planters right, who, who had already sort of uh, set up plantations uh, on the hill. So this is possibly the uh, earliest uh, record right, of, 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 of occupation of the hill right, or making, the, making use of the, of the hill. So this is a, uh, this is a view, right? Uh, this is a view of um, Saligi Road and uh, Princep Street. So, so, so you can see this is uh, in uh, 1950s, you can see that the whole area was uh, built up with sort of mainly uh, shop houses but right? then of course you have uh, different uh, buildings but of course you notice that the, the building height is not that high right? and uh, right, right across you can see some of these uh, boats right? with their masts right? uh, out, out at sea right? near, near where Beach Road is and then of course this is a uh, middle road that runs right through from the, from the hills to the sea. Okay? Uh, this is the this is again the blue dot is here. Right? So what, what we're looking at is you know from uh, Mount Sophia. And this is Mount Sophia behind Mount Abbey. And what is an important sort of an urban feature is that coming from Orchard Road, it, you know the road actually sort of more or less sort of turns around the corner, right, uh, and then crosses crosses Ruto Canal and then all the way to Serangoon Road. Uh, Serangoon Road being one of the earliest uh, roads. That led to the so-called suburbs or, or, or the countryside. So this was a kind of like an inflection point, and the urban planning sort of reflected, you know, that early thing with with uh, this uh, coit uh, terrace. Uh, I'm not sure some of you may, may remember that there were some shop houses here. 
uh, but there was also a, a triangular patch of, um, of a, a small field right? that's, that's right in front. So here, this this is probably an aerial shot. This is this is Cathay build, uh, building as it was before, Bras Basah Road, and then of course then you turn turn from uh, Handy Road and Orchard Road into uh, Saligi Road, right? And, and then of course these are the sort of shop house districts. So so you can see that um, Cathay Building was actually a very important pivotal point, right? Where the whole uh, sort of city turned right to to, to the suburbs. Uh, this is probably taken also from Cathay building itself, right? Uh, looking down right through uh, Bras Basah Road, right? So this is Bras Basah Road, uh, right through to, to, to the sea, right? uh, the time. So you can, you, can, you can tell immediately because this is the, this is S, uh, the old SGI building, right? Now. And you also know that this is uh, probably before uh, 1960s when the, uh, when they took the, uh, Second World War Memorial, the, the chopsticks. Okay, so by by the by by the nineteen fifties, by the nineteen fifties, uh, you know most of the uh, Malay communities that we uh, we saw before on the earlier map sort of have have moved away, and you know we, we only have sort of a remnants of uh, Kampung Glam, right? And um, the um, the Europeans have actually sort of uh, left this area by now, right? And move inwards to you know sort of nicer places like Tangling and so on and so forth. So this whole area became uh, a very mixed area. So in fact, you know, we, we often think about uh, the sort of racial enclaves, right? Chinese, Malay, Indian, something. But this area here became a really amazing uh, multicultural, multi-ethnic sort of uh, sort of location, and uh, with sort of different uh, ethnic groups starting to uh, settle in. With uh, Hainanese, Hakka, Japanese, you know, Fuchao, Hinghua, so and so forth. So you can you you, you now know why sort of why you know this is like kind of like the birthplace of uh, chicken rice, right? Or <laughs> or even you know uh, Fuchao, Fuchao fish balls and things like that. Right? So these are and and of course um, for the Chinese uh, community, this was so called Xiao Bo. I don't know if you all mm -hmm. heard of the term Xiao Bo before. So in fact, it's actually erroneous to say you know that Singapore has a Chinatown right? because actually Singapore has two two Chinatowns, right? one on the Singapore River side and, and one on this side. So this some there are some um, slides just to show right the the, the kind of um, uh, the kind of a very rich character of, of different uh, religious groups uh, being in the area. Uh, so much so that even you know you have a uh, Sri Krishna Bhagawan Temple, uh, you know just quite close to uh, Waterloo Street, uh, the Kuan Yin Temple. In fact, you know sometimes the devotees would just gasu right so after 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 Kuan Yin Temple, we also go and pray to uh, Hindu gods as well. Okay. So that's um, that's the first part, right? uh, really to suggest that uh, it's a really, really uh, kind of rich place. Uh, and the second uh, part of the talk actually uh, is to try to introduce this, this uh, building typology that's actually quite important, I think is uh, still under study. And of course, Peace Center is uh, an important building uh, from 1974. And you can see this is from the sales brochure. Right. I, I tried. I tried to sort of translate into English. Uh, it says it's a kind of like a, e, e, you know, epoch crossing, uh, high class building located at the junction of uh, Saligi Road and Sophia Road. Um, the tower block is uh, thirty one stories high, uh, so and so square meters. Then you have um, shopping arcades, department stores, supermarket, thirty six lane bowling alley. Of course, it's not there now. Offices, banks. Specialist clinics, restaurants, buffet restaurants, and car park for five hundred cars. So, so this actually represented a kind of very important mixed use building. Right? Mixed use meaning that you have you have really a lot of uh, different uh, activities that can be placed in one uh, building, as uh, similar to the kind of uh, very uh, interesting and complicated nature of the uh, area itself. So the, the podium uh, tower block typology actually was, is a, kind of a result of uh, zoning uh, zoning uh, histories. Uh, specifically in uh, 1916 in New York, right? 
because prior to that, when um, developers build, build buildings, they would build straight up, right? So, you, so you imagine you get a plot of land and just build everything up. But of course, that caused a lot of uh, problems in the uh, kind of city scape, right? Because it would block out the sun, it would also block out some sort of uh, uh, ventilation. So this this ruling from 1916 stipulated that you have to set back the the, the, the main tower block, right? And it gave rise to a very interesting uh, building buildings. Uh, one of the sort of very modern uh, buildings in New York is this, this thing called the Lever House, where you can see a very clear uh, podium level, right? Which actually is uh, you know, usually three, four stories high, which would kind of relate to the streetscape. And then the 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 tower block is uh, is set back, right? It's set back, and and of course exists itself. And this is not a uh, an idea that's only confined to New York, right? If you if you look around at the old uh, Cathay building, right, from, uh, built in 1939, you can see that the, the messing or, or how how you, you place the sort of different densities. Uh, you have this big uh, sort of a block in front, but then the tower is in a uh, place right closer to closer to uh, to Mount Sophia. So in in, in a sense, it's kind of uh, um, you know, it's it's rather like a, a shop house uh, that we also sort of uh, was was here before, right? Uh, that uh, was found in you know most parts of the city, where you have commercial you know or shop space or whatever uh, activities below uh, on the ground level, and then the upper levels are used for for residents, right? So as you can see in this uh, uh, demolished uh, Rocha Center here, we have. Uh, again, right, the different shops, community spaces, and all that on the podium level, right, and then of course you have apartment uh, units uh, in, in I think four blocks uh, on, on the whole site right? so, uh, for for Rocha Center. Uh, and this area actually is the uh, associated with the, the development of that uh, podium uh, podium tower tower typology. Uh, beginning not with uh, HDB but with uh, the Singapore Improvement Trust, uh, with the construction of what was known as the Stanford Estate. Right. So there are two phases. Uh, in 1958, they built uh, these three blocks, and it was touted as a second change alley. Right. But of course, I think uh, for for this generation, it's actually hard to imagine how vibrant uh, a change a change alley was. But it uh, basically had uh, podiums, right? It had, uh, it had, uh, I think, thirty over shops, around thirty-four lock-up shops, and, and all that. And then, of course, you have uh, blocks of birth. Okay, this is now where uh, the La Salle uh, School of the Arts is. Then, of course, directly across, you have uh, again a very important uh, experiment. Um, in 1963, you have a uh, Seligi House, right? Uh, two blocks of ten story, one block of twenty story, and then. Shops are very strong. Okay. And, and of course, you can see that uh, uh, the Housing Development Board actually built a lot of these uh, in, in, in the 1960s and 1970s. And of course, it made sense because, right, uh, if you imagine at that time, you know, the streets were, were packed with uh, hawkers, right? they were packed with uh, sort of uh, people living, uh, living outdoors and things like that. So, so these were actually very important, uh, uh, you know, solutions, right, to uh, solving sort of the congestions uh, of, the, of the city with, with these kind of block, and it, it went by different names, right, uh, parks, plazas, uh, centers, and complexes. Okay. And uh, around around uh, this area, right, mm -hmm. you, you can already see uh, Waterloo Center, nineteen seventy eight. Rasputa complex, uh, Chingyang Court, and, and of course Rochelle Center. But this was not only confined. Uh, sorry. So, so this was this is this is actually what uh, kind of potential of a uh, uh, podium tower uh, development can be. Right? This is uh, Outram Park. Right? How many of you have been to this this Outram Park? Yeah. <laughs> so he, he can tell you more about it. So you can, so you can see actually it becomes a very interesting. Uh, um, part of the part of the development, if you can sort of uh, develop uh, uh, imaginatively around right, this block, it's also not uh, in the realm of uh, um, public uh, you know, um, uh, infrastructure, right? Uh, like like uh, those that were built by HDB. Right? In the private sector, you 
this uh, typology is also very much uh, you know, uh, encouraged. And of course, Speed Center is not just one of them, but you can see that there are so many different uh, other types, right? like, like Park Hall, which is one of the first um, shopping centers of that, of that type, uh, People's Park, which came uh, later, slightly later in 1973, and, and so on and so forth, like uh, Golden Mile Complex, and so on and so forth. So, and, and even you know, across uh, Middle Road, right? So this Middle Road is actually very long. You, you have two bookends of, you know, more or less, you know, uh, Peace Centre here, and then uh, previously, right, uh, Shaw, Shaw Tower sort of book ended the, the other end of, uh, of Middle Road, and um, and these are these are the sort of architects uh, who, who designed it, Charles Ho and uh, Lo Yu Tian. This is very important because if you if you look across, right, you travel along Beach Road and you actually don't feel that there is such a high uh, building uh, right in your in your face, so to speak. So, with these two buildings, it seems like you know a lot of um, architects have forgotten you know uh, how important you know how uh, important urban design is to the, to the city, and also perhaps right how to design. Right? So you can see these are the new developments that replace uh, replace uh, uh, the shock cat, uh, cat building, <coughs> cat building, and then that that corner where. Uh, uh, Kirk Terrace is right. Is now the uh, School of the Arts, right? So this is this is from a street directory. So you can see previously the the, the nice curve going around the we got right to the Swangun Road. But unfortunately, the planners uh, have decided to give up this small triangular space uh, to, um, to 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 develop uh, the School of the Arts. So so in effect, now you have to sort of travel past this and turn a corner right, rather than sort of moving, uh, moving around the that, that block. Right? And this is what happens when you have um, architects who are really not really good architects. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, the cafe is designed by Paul Tange, uh, who is supposed to be the son of a famous architect. Uh, and then of course you have Woha designing the School of the Arts. But you, you can take a look at it, right? There is no way that they are trying to address um, this, this whole sort of a turning of the corner. It is very harsh for pedestrians, right? So the, the School of the Arts, can you imagine, you know, this is really you know, a, a, a school, right? Just like SGI and all that. But it, you know, it seems to have required so much bulk, right? And arch architects have not been able to understand how, you know, that kind of a corner was designed in the past and how that relates to the history of the place. So, so much for architecture. <laughs> okay, so, so that's, that's, this is my last slide. Uh, that's actually the two points that I really wanted to share with you. So maybe we can talk more about that afterwards. Uh, Thank you very much. Could I just grab the mic? Thanks very much. <clears throat> Thanks, Shijian. That was a really impressive covering of 200 years of architectural history. I'm sure we'll have time later during the panel discussion to talk more about some of these points as well. Um, before uh, I invite Sam to start her sharing, could I just invite the back row of people who are standing here to move in by about two meters so that the folks who are there can also see the screen? Thank you. Oh, yes. OK. Yes, there is also more space on the floor and on the beanbags uh, if those who are sitting on the corners um, want to move towards the centre. Um, while, while you guys are moving, um, allow me to introduce our next speaker, who is Sam Chia. Um, Sam is half of the UNIT project, uh, which she's going to tell you a little bit about. She's bought a copy of UNIT. Um, UNIT was uh, published and sold out in 2022. Um, Sam is also an architectural writer and urban planner. So, over to Sam. Oh, oh, you have a mic. Hello, yes, it's working. Hi, um, uh, yes, as you said, my name is uh, Samantha. And um, I just want to start the, the presentation by giving some caveats. I'm not an academic like Jitian. So everything I'm sharing is something that I have researched in my own. Um, it's, it's better not to be an Just that um, everything I've researched, I'm sharing is something that I've read or researched in my own free time. I'm not a subject matter expert. Um, I'm just really interested in architecture urban planning. And I sound like a geek. 
But a lot of that um, research influenced the book that uh, Tio was talking about, um, which is UNIT, uh, a glimpse into Singapore's 1970s and 80s um, private apartments. Um, we did over two print runs, um, and it's currently sold out. I don't know how many of you have seen the book or are familiar with it, um, but basically it's a, sum, um, it's a collection of uh, interviews and photographs from 10 families living in 10 different uh, apartment buildings that were built in Singapore between the 1970s to 80s, um, basically the time period, thank you so much, after Singapore's uh, independence, uh, like Golden Mall Complex, uh, People's Park Complex, and the Palisades. Um, what strikes me about these buildings is that they are, to me, um, really much buildings of that time, and they reflect or imbue the ideas that we were experimenting with, uh, that Singapore was experimenting with collectively, um, as we tried to progress to the modern city that we are, or the modern country that we are um, today. So uh, Peace Centre, uh, or Peace Mansion, uh, which is the residential component, isn't one of the buildings um, that we covered, but it was built um, in the 1970s. And from what I know, or what I read, um, it does share some of the same origin stories. So I thought I would talk very briefly about um, three concepts that sort of inform the buildings of this era, um, including Peace Centre. Um, and that's the uh, government land sales program. I swear I'm not here representing the government. Um, the idea of uh, Singapore's um, early real estate industry, um, what it was like back then, and then how that has influenced um, what we see as Peace Centre today, which is a, a strata titled building, this idea of uh, collective ownership and maintenance. So um, first, uh, the government land sales, or we call it GLS program, um, this was first launched in 1967 by the Urban Renewal Department, uh, which is basically the predecessor of URA. Um, and it's a tool that the government still uses today. Um, and in very simplistic terms, what it does is that it's a vehicle for the government to realize its land use plans for the site. So for example, the government would say this site is meant for a commercial slash mixed use building, and then they, uh, it's a vacant piece of land, and then the developer comes and bids for the site. Uh, takes the site and develops it according to the government's guidelines. So in the 1960s to 70s, um, the GLS program focused more on how to renew and redevelop the city centre and boost, really boost economic development. It was really tied to how do we modernise, get the money in and become more um, economically strong. So the first three uh, GLS programmes from 1967 to 1969 they basically focus on building hotels, building shopping malls, and office towers, basically the ones that you see uh, in the CBD. And so um, buildings like uh, Golden Mile Complex and People's Park Complex, they came from the first uh, GLS program uh, in 1967. And then Peace Centre came from the third GLS program uh, in 1969. And I'm just going to show these other sites, which, are, which I just thought was really interesting. So that's Peace Centre over here, and then this is a map of the sites that they sold in the past. Um, and I also thought what was interesting was that back then, uh, the department, uh, uh, Urban Renewal Department, would have tried to, maybe because it was so new, they gave ideas to the uh, architects and the developers of what they thought the building could look like. And as the architect slash developer, you could actually take the plans wholesale and build it as it is. And there are buildings today that are exactly the same, like almost copy and paste of those uh, plans. But this is what the government had proposed uh, Peace Centre look like. And you can see that it does have that podium tower typology, but it is slightly different in that the, I think the residential block is like the higher tower block is further behind. Whereas here, they, uh, they position it further in front. Uh, and then just for uh, reference, uh, this is what Golden Mount Complex could have looked like, uh, but it's not. Um, so they had proposed actually four tower luxury apartments. Um, but the architects and the developers came and said, you know, I want to do something different, I want to do a mixed use development, and then this is what we see today, which is a very iconic uh, piece of architecture. Um, People's Park Complex is a little bit more similar in the podium tower typology, um, but there's only one tower instead of uh, three. Um, yeah. And then, but moving on, uh, talking about Singapore's early real estate uh, industry, I think one of the things that you first notice is that um, the developments I showed you earlier, their buildings are fairly high intensity. Of course, today you see like shopping malls and offices that are much bigger in scale. The sites are bigger, there's, there's more users inside. But back then, this was considered big. And um, in the past, something of that scale was considered a fairly big undertaking. But more importantly, to build this thing, you need the money to do it. And developers back then had fairly limited capital. 
we didn't have like the homegrown institutional developers that you have maybe see today, like you know your capital land or your CDL. Um, and we also didn't have the sort of institutional investors who could fund uh, these developments. So what that means is that for you to be able to build something like this, the developer had to sort of recycle their limited capital, and they did it by subdividing their shopping centers or their office buildings into strata title units and then selling them to individual buyers. So they would sell the units, get the cash, grow their capital, and then maybe use it for a second or third uh, development. And the interesting thing for me was that some of the developers uh, didn't even start back then from the real estate industry. They were from maybe other uh, sectors or businesses. And they were sort of apparently persuaded by the government to venture into real estate. Uh, of course, earn the money that you can earn, get a profit, but also contribute to nation building. So this is the advertisement for a uh, Golden <coughs> Complex when it was first launched. And the article actually says this firm, uh, Singapore Developments, was a firm that was formed to help in nation building. And People's Park Com uh, and uh, Peace Centre as well, or People's Park Complex, they might also have uh, similar origin stories. Um, for example, for People's Park Complex, um, it was developed by a prominent glass merchant. His name was Mr. Ho Kok Chiong. Um, and similarly, he didn't have the capital to create a People's Park Complex. So what he did, which was considered quite innovative back then, was that he sold the shop units off plan uh, prior to the completion of the building, um, which is actually something that we're quite used to today. So you know, if you buy a, you know, if you buy a condominium, for example, a condo unit, you do go to the, the show flat and then you're like, okay, I want this one. You know? And that's kind of what they did, they did back then, which is that they would have shown the models and the plans on the site, and then people would come in and say, okay, I want to buy this shop unit, I want to buy that office unit. Um, yeah. And developers also have done, uh, the, the owners also have done the same thing as what we do today if we buy a condo unit. They would pay the developer installments, and as the, uh, as the construction co uh, progress, they would pay uh, a larger and larger sum of that uh, deposit payment. Um, Kian An Reality, uh, the, de uh, de the developer for Peace Center, also sort of adopted that strategy, but it was a uh, part rental and part sales strategy. So they sold, all the residences were sold. Um, some of the shop and office units they kept for themselves, but others they, and, and then they rented that out, but others they also um, sold it uh, to what it is today. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, you can see over here in this uh, advertisement, like, you know, uh, a few units there, rental sale, da da da. Yeah. So in an environment where um, you were trying to build your capital, um, that strategy really made sense to them. Today, I think there are very few uh, such developers that still do this. You have your more like institutional developers who rather buy and hold the development, especially if it's in a city centre location, <coughs> and collect the rent and let that development's value appreciate um, over time. So I think uh, moving on to the last topic, I think a common sentiment that we hear or feel about uh, newer shopping malls today is that, you know, oh, they all look the same. Like, you know, every mall has a Uniqlo or a Din Tai Fung. If it doesn't have a Uniqlo, it probably means it's not doing very well. <laughs> um, and then, you know, with that same base, you might come to Peace Center or, you know, uh, Fai Shop, uh, Fai Plaza and think, like, oh, these malls are really interesting. They're very eclectic, they're very unique, and they have shops that I wouldn't really see in a typical uh, shopping mall that I see, it, for example, along Orchard Road. And if you're asking yourself, like, why is that so? Part of the reason has to do with the ownership structure, which I was alluding to earlier of these malls. So in the case of Peace Center and Fai's Plaza, for example, um, instead of having a single owner who manages the building and then he decides all his tenant makes, uh, you have a building which is owned by uh, different people and different entities. And in the past, actually even before this, ownership structures were less evolved. So the developer would sell the units to individual owners, but he would still own the land. So he owns the common property, like the corridors and the walkways and so on. And actually because of this, maintenance issues uh, became a problem because as the development became more complex, the developer may no longer be around or would may no longer be as invested in the building. A lot of the shop owners had conflicts with the person who was, uh, or residences who had conflicts with the developer who owned the common ground saying, hey, you know, you're not maintaining my building. Um, so actually there was a period of transition um, where early developments transitioned from having the developer own the land to then taking back the land and owning that land uh, collectively. And today I believe uh, most, if not all, developments uh, which have fragmented ownership are what we call uh, strata titled buildings. This means that you not only own your individual unit, which is you know, maybe an office or a shop or even an apartment, 
but you also share ownership of the land and the common areas. So for example, the lifts, the driveways, the common walkways, uh, you share the maintenance and the ownership of that with your neighbours. And again, back then, this was a very new uh, concept. Even the idea of a condominium, for example, which is a strata type of building, you know, we think of it as a high-rise uh, private residential building, you know, you have certain images like a swimming pool, a tennis console. Actually, the condominium itself is a planning concept. And the word condominium comes from uh, early Latin, or modern Latin, con meaning uh, together with, and dominium meaning right of ownership. So it was a concept that was introduced, uh, it was first known to be used in the early 1700s, but it became more used in like the 1900s and so on, when we had such pieces of large uh, developments where we shared uh, ownership with each, uh, with our neighbours. And I've also brought with me a guide to condominium housing in Singapore, which is a 1980s version of Property Guru. <laughs> <laughs> all the different uh, condominiums back then in the 1980s and I just wanted to share a little bit of what this book says about condominium developments um, it said, okay, condominiums existed in Singapore even before it was formally introduced in, 1970 in 1972 to the private residential sector and the word condominium originally meant joint ownership which is you know what I see on the slide here um, in the case of condominiums in Singapore, joint ownership only applies to the land in common areas. An owner of a condominium unit, whether residential, commercial, or industrial, has an exclusive ownership of the unit and an undivided share or interest in the land and the common areas. And you know, that can include like the roofs, stairways, corridors, and so on and so forth. Condominiums in Singapore are more a planning concept. And, and after that, it talks about like the, the list of guidelines that it has to like, uh, for, comply with. Yep. So, uh, book reading for a non-fiction book. And um, I sort of wanted to talk about, in some ways, do you then think of the strata building as a sort of like modern day kampo? You know, where you know we're doing something like this today, uh, we're harnessing the power of the collective, and we're doing things for the greater good uh, and for the community. We have such events like this, and they are really, um, really quite amazing to see when the community bands together and create something like this, it can be really very um, beautiful. But I also want to balance that with the very real issues that such buildings can face. Um, and maybe our last speaker might talk about a little bit of that later, where, you know, not just the mix of the shops and the neighbours, um, the maintenance <coughs> issues may also become uh, an issue. Um, so this is an article uh, from the Business Times in 1993. And it does talk about like the challenges that mm -hmm. such strata titled malls, like for example, Peace Centre, or People's Park Complex had faced uh, back then, where because they, there's no singular authority to control the type of retail mix they had, you know, everyone is doing their own thing, they're not able to draw the same the kind of crowd that maybe other malls in, let's say, Orchard Road would have had. And even for, um, let's say, in terms of maintenance issues, um, when I was talking about interviewing the families for uh, this book, 1970s, 80s private apartments, a lot of them talk about you know, how amazing it is to live in such a beautiful uh, piece of architecture. You know, the apartments are really cool and all that, and the space is of course much bigger than what you get today. But they will always preface that by saying like, oh, the maintenance is really an issue. And then sometimes um, we end up fighting with our neighbours because we cannot decide what to do with the building. There are some buildings where um, the structure is a little bit more complicated. They will say something like, oh, you know, even, to, even to put up the scaffolding to rethink the building, cost me almost 30 to 50k just for the scaffolding, not even including the manpower or the cost of the paint. And then we had another apartment which had uh, maybe just, I think, 17 or 19 units. And they were describing like, oh, when they were deciding whether or not should we unblock the development, they were like, you know, mini turf walls, like, this neighbour is not going to talk to this neighbour. Or like, you know, we have like our own house parties, but we're not going to invite each other because you know, we disagree on some of these very fundamental issues. So you can see like, um, I think there's always two sides, like there's a power to do something very beautiful like this. But when the um, ownership is shared and the ideas of doing that is fragmented, there can be a lot of conflicts and a lot of discussions and tensions that happen in such buildings. Yep. Okay, thank you. Thanks very much, Sam. Um, I'm very excited to be introducing our third speaker, um, Ho Ying Long. Um, Ying Long is part of the family behind City Music, which has been here in Peace Center for 43 years. And Inglong himself has established um, himself in the, in the musical instruments and professional audio industry over the last two decades. So Inglong, over to you to tell us a little bit of 
what it was like to be in this development. All right. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon. Good evening. Uh, my name is Yang Long. Um, I don't have any slides, but I'll probably just share some of our experiences and stories in during our our existence here in P Center. To be more specific, in this particular unit that everyone is sitting here, and it gives me big pleasure and. It's a, it's, a, it's a mixed feeling for me to come back here to see um, all of you all filling up the space, which we used to fill up our space in, in our nature of our business. And also it gives me great um, honor to be part of today's uh, panel. Um, I would like to thank Phil and um, Eddie and Yvonne, and of course, uh, my honor of speaking with Jiken and Samantha. Um, <clears throat> so uh, a little bit of intro introduction. Um, I'm the sales director of City Music. I'm the second generation owner of the business. And we, so a, a bit about background. We started in 1968. Okay, uh, just before I continue further, um, the previous two presenters shared all the stories. It's, it was basically a memory lane for me because everything that they talk about, I grew up in that, all these places, including Brass Bassa, Peace Center, Ultra Park, People's Park. <laughs> okay. Um, um, my mom's an architect, by the way. She, she she's over here, so so um, she probably can share share some common um, experiences here too. So it's it's really memorable for me to be to to witness all those things. It's it's really heartwarming. So a little bit about what we do. We are in the. I see some probably some of you are our, our clients before. Uh, still our clients, and we are in the musical instruments and audio. Uh, wholesale and retail and uh, we have we started in we did not start originally in this particular space we started in 1968 not too long after our nation building 1965 so we were in a different location brass was which is actually it, it, it brings a lot of memories when when, when they were, uh, the earlier presenters were sharing so it was only in 1980 2nd of august that we officially moved from Brass Barsa to Peace Centre, this particular unit. So when we were in Brass Barsa, we were still a very small, humble piano shop. Um, if you have witnessed, there is also another piano company just below us called Rana Piano. So in the 1968, that era before we moved here, we were like that a traditional piano company. So of course, when we moved here, this is where we actually started to grow alongside with uh, the music scene and music industry. Um, so that's a bit about what uh, we do. But before I go into more details about um, City Music in Peace Center, I think I would like to again draw some parallels to what Chicken uh, has brought up earlier on. Um, Peace Center, we for us in this industry, because uh, for the past 40 years, so actually we were here in for, uh, for 43 years, we left last year. April 2023, all right? So that was our last day we shut down. So we actually had a very nice uh, farewell ceremony. A lot of our friends and customers dropped by just want to take photos of this place before they leave. And actually very, very heartened to see uh, what Thrift and Secondhand you know, Chinese Story has, has done with this place to, to continue preserving as long as they can. I'll, I'll, be, I'll be just as sad as them and to, to see this place go, right? So. A bit about Siddiqui Road, I think uh, we have to look at a bit more macro approach because Peace Centre is part of the Siddiqui Belt, I would call that. Because Siligi, along Siddiqui Road, it's actually three main buildings. Three and a half, okay? One of, the first one will actually be Cafe Cinema, although it's not along uh, Siddiqui Road. But when, let's say we're going to tell our clients, oh, how to come to Peace Centre, how to come to City Music, we will use Cafe as the as the landmark, you know, go to Kelly Cinema after the travel actor left, that will be the hero. And you will hit the first building, which is called, which was called at the time, po uh, Paradise, Paradise Center. Uh, it has changed a few hands, then subsequently became POMO, P-O-M-O. And now, of course, very recently it became a more cyber looking mall, great, which I still trying to get a hold of what they're doing with the mall, actually. So, um, and actually, this whole stretch of piece. Oh, and of course, opposite there was a, uh, uh, there is still the Siddiqui Art Center, which is a very. Uh, so actually, this whole area is very vibrant, and I would like to call it. We we used to call it as entertainment zone, 
because we have so many things going on. We have music scenes, us, music companies, there were music schools, there were rental recording studios, there were entertainment. When I mean entertainment, so we have we used to have snooker parlors, video arcade centers, adult entertainment venues. I'm, I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. And uh, so basically the KTV joints and uh, lots of food and beverages uh, outlets. So, um, okay. So it, it was a very vibrant, vibrant scene and we actually did grow along. Um, and because of us, we are one of the pioneers in, in this industry. We also managed to draw in quite a number of different music, mu music companies, so to speak. So that's why uh, uh, a few of our competitors also came here. And we actually welcome that because we need a collective of different competition or even uh, complementing kind of industry to build up the space. So in, in this, in, in the, the glory days of between 1990s to mid 2000, I would say that was the peak because it was so many things happening along this, this street here. And uh, by the later years, um, you know, especially after COVID, so I think that the key draw of uh, people coming to Peace Center will be usually mainly to, to visit us. And also there was a printing shop downstairs, right, which actually were catering to a lot of the other art schools and uh, universities. And also because we happened to be in the Waterloo Arts Belt, right? So we were actually help to nurture the whole, whole scene here. So we have NAFA, we have LaSalle, we have SMU, we have Soka School of the Arts. And uh, it, this, this whole zone became like a very, very popular hangout place for the youth, for the uh, musicians, uh, music enthusiasts, uh, people in the art scenes that they want to hang out here because there is, um, there's, there's rehearsal studios, there's, we come here to us to check out new equipment that we have, all right? So um, let's move on to, let's say, uh, our experiences here. And for us, we have seen the ups and downs of, of this building here. Uh, during our, I mean, even, even for the past 40 years here, we have made so much friends with a lot of beautiful, um, connect, we made a lot of beautiful connections with musicians, both internationally, locally. Uh, to name a few, we have like, um, Power Station, Tony Water visiting us because usually when musicians, they tour around the world, they would like to go and visit all the different key musical instruments outlet. We have Mr. Big Band uh, members came by. We have Rock Band Dream Theater coming to visit us. We also have Celebrity, uh, this is quite interesting. Uh, not, not really in the music scene. Um, Hong Kong actress Cecilia Chong, right? So one day she just came on a skateboard Quite cool, a cool mom. Just skip right into our, our store here and pick up a guitar and, and it's like, oh, okay, she, she picked up something for kids. And then just, just a uh, very cool mom, right? So of course we, <laughs> okay. So we also have our local music heroes like JJ Lin visiting us. We all, I mean, we're all in the industry. We have jazz legend, Jerry Montero. We have uh, all these um, bands like The Quest. Uh, we have the more um, more modern uh, musicians, Gentle Bones, we have Instra, we have just, I mean, the, the list goes on, too many to, to, to really share. So it was actually, we were like a hub. We were like a melting pot. They come in, they, they, they meet. So this is, uh, has always been what cinema music has been, uh, you know, what we believe in to really generate connections. So Peace Center to us was a very unique, mix uh, of tenants. If you're just talking about uh, um, just on the retail, because if you look at the whole Peace Center, uh, as what uh, the previous presenters have shared, there are actually four main components. Retail, offices, residential, and car park. Right? So we have a very, very unique mix of tenants. Uh, we have musical companies like us, music schools, we have printing companies, we have we have a skin clinic, which is very famous. Some, some of them are still still around to, towards the end of it. Some of them, they, they were too old already. They, they didn't continue the business. There were law firms, there were- Architectural firms. Architectural firms, yes, correct. Um, and of course, there were some other companies that you walk past and you're wondering what kind of business are they in anyway, right? So, um, <laughs> so it was a very unique um, 
charm of, of uh, being in Peace Center. And of course, uh, to really um, elaborate a bit more about the maintenance issue that Samantha had shared. So our glory days during 90s, early 2000s, that was, I think, in terms of the condition of the game, that was the peak already. Because, um, as you all know, the whole site was put up for collective sale. And actually, it went through six collective sale attempts. That means meaning on the sixth collective sale attempt, it really went through. But you think about the previous five attempts, each collective sale period ranges from between the three to the five years. So you're talking about at least 15 to 18 years. So each failed collective sale attempt, right? So just now, Samedo was mentioning the Kianan, which was the main developer, who was also the main uh, majority of the share owners. Yeah. They have a change in agenda because they have, since the first collective sale, they want to let go of this place. So basically, it is an end of, it, an end of an era in this, this place, unfortunately. So, after each failed attempt, the maintenance, the condition just went spiral downhill. So just to share, <laughs> you know, the charm, we're, 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 I mean, being sarcastic, I would call it a charm here. The charm about having peace and that we have one of the best toilets here. <laughs> <laughs> we have one, why the best? Because it's, it's, I don't want to scare you all. Okay? <laughs> we have, one of the best car parks and the most uh, reasonable car park because uh, you you pay you pay you pay shelter way prices, um, but I think you're, you're not going to get the the, the auction road kind of condition of a car park. Um, the lifts they don't work all the time, and so but but we 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 we, we take it you know it's right you know it's that's part of the charm we 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 grow onto it, and yeah so. Let me next just share a bit about this space here. So this, this as I said, it, it is really nice at the same time, unusual and weird for me to be sitting right here and seeing you all feeling this space that used to be where we put out all our guitars. My marketing team is around. They were like, when they first came in, they were like, my, off, my, my marketing guy, his table was, was inside that room. Uh, my table was, my, my, my office was inside there. This was our big boss's room, uh, but I think it's a storeroom, I heard. <laughs> okay, so um, this structure, so Chiki was asking me about this, this, this unique structure. Uh, internally, we, we, we call it, uh, we have a nickname, uh, Garden by the Bay. <laughs> Super Tree. Super Tree, yes, correct. Um, it was not deliberate, it was not intentional. It was already around when, even before we moved in 1980. So we just, instead of, uh, we, we actually had multiple occasions, you know, we went through multiple renovations throughout the 40 years, obviously. We said, should we take it out, you know, we preserve it. So we have actually all the way been preserving it. So um, it's, it's, it was, it was, it used to be glass, stained glass on, on top. And so we, we were also trying to find out details about what was the previous owner before we moved in in 1980s. We couldn't get a firm confirmation, but we guess it was something along the line of night entertainment. So that's why the wallpapers um, that were, if you see inside this room, the, the wallpapers were actually silver. Uh, with the, they used to be couches. Around. So I guess it, it, should be, it should be night entertainment. So also, and a little bit about a, so I was mentioning there was actually four components. City Mills, uh, Peace Center, all right, when, when we close shop at night. So uh, Peace Center, day and night is very different. When it comes night, it becomes second life, all right? Because the car park podium there is six floors of karaoke bars. So it was this particular window here this was basically the, the front seat, the hot seat. Because every day around 4 to 5 p.m., you see all the supercars coming down, parking at the valley, they were picking up all the, all the, all the hostesses coming out. And it's usually quite eye candy for my, my staff. They, they, they want to stand there. <laughs> yeah. And interesting for us, so of course, after, uh, don't get me, right? we, 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 we don't patronize those things. It's too, too close to our back yet, so we don't really patronize those things. <laughs> So for us and, and also the residential. So actually we also used to own one of the residential units. So 
whatever we all share today is really means means uh, a lot of uh, prepared on memory for us. The residential was also a very commonly um, rented out to overseas students. Are they real students? I don't know. <laughs> so you will probably you can also probably guess, and they they all uh, by convenience they stay here, and you know at night they work there. And sometimes I will quite often we will see them early in the morning, so they look very different at night and day because they'll be walking around in their pajamas. All right, so that's that's a I I realize that's quite a common. Uh, they like to walk around in their pajamas, buying breakfast, and doing their shopping to the supermarket and before they going back. Yeah, I forgot to mention. Um, that that big outlet there, it was a very important uh, uh, on the ground floor. It was actually a very important supermarket that we were we were actually we actually missed it so much. It was cold storage, and then you then became NTUC. Or oh, I can't remember. You don't want to open the secret. So this this was actually a very very unique, beautiful, unique mix of tenants that what what we used to have here. So I guess that's about all I. Because I mean I can go on, but there are too too many things to share. So I think that's all I would share in, in this, this short little sharing station session. So a little of our stories. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you once again to all three uh, panelists. That has actually brought us quite nicely to the hour. We do have about fifteen minutes more for some time for questions. Um, so we let me just jump straight into it and see if anybody has any questions. Um, for any of our three speakers today. Anyone? Yes. Um, just, just curious about the, the naming of the, the place, Peace Centre, is that, do you, you know about the history of it? Uh, and I, I also noticed the Chinese uh, translation for the piece is Jian An. Jian An. So the, the developer's name, uh, the title already has peace in it. So could be could be one of the reasons. But I, I, I we really don't. I, I haven't been able to find. Yeah. Jian Jian Sorry, Jian Jian is the developer. So Jian Jian. So the so the Chinese Chinese is is Jian An. Yeah. By the way, today's event is called Building Peace. Yeah. So Jian An literally. <laughs> <laughs> So all around, uh, there, there are some connections back to that. Uh, peace, peace building, not building peace. Yeah. Actually, Chidian, since you have the mic now, I wanted to see if you wanted to talk about this, um, which oh, you yes. built. Uh, I, I, I thought it was uh, going to be uh, interesting to just suggest how for uh, the flow center uh, can be built. Uh, so, so this, this basically, uh, so, so mainly I think the, the podium block uh, Gives a kind of like a datum level uh, in the city, so you, you, you know you you are actually relating to a scale of like three to four stories. Then the bulk, which is what uh, you know is required right to, to build up density, is then sort of a place at the back. So it's a very crude uh, crude uh, way of just uh, showing how how podium uh, tower works. Yeah. Actually, we were quite ambitious. We wanted to do the ultra. There's a whole box of books behind here, as you can tell me. Thanks. Any other questions? Otherwise, well, I have one for the panelists as well. I mean, um, so we've gone through so many different aspects of the history of this space, both the architectural history, the urban history, as well as the lived history of this space. Um, as a history student myself, I think looking back, history always seems to be very set in stone. But I just wanted to ask all three of you, if you could go back in time and do one thing differently, whether that's you personally doing one thing differently, or you wish one thing in history had not gone the way that it did, what what would that be? <laughs> yeah, maybe you can start with yeah, I, I think I'm a little bit of a pragmatist in the sense that I wouldn't change anything. Because if we change any change anything, we may no longer be here today, you know, sitting together in this space. And I do think that it is the things that happen in history that inform how the building is or developed or read and how we respond to the building as it is today. So rather than saying like, oh, what do I change if I go back in history? I think it's more about what can we learn from the interesting stories of Peace Center or of similar buildings. And what is it that we can do differently for 
other experiences in you know in, in your life or in Singapore and so on. So that's my perspective. I shall pass the mic down. <laughs> okay. Um in interestingly I think another friend wanted to me to talk about another type of uh, cooperative. Right? And when I say the word cooperative, there's a whole history of the cooperative movement that had somehow been submerged. Uh, uh, it, it started out um, basically in 1925, and it started with uh, what are called thrift and loan companies. Right? So any anything can be a co cooperative. So in in a, in a way, this is a cooperative, where you know it, it sounds like it's a kind of struggle kind of thing, but the mm -hmm. uh, ownership and the responsibilities are also shared amongst that cooperative. Uh, and it bears uh, remembering that. NTUC actually is a cooperative. Yeah. NTUC Comfort is a cooperative, right? And uh, and of course, those of you who work in into NUS, you all go to the co-op, right? Uh, so this property movement actually had, had extended to uh, housing, extended to farming, extended. And I think um, I I really think that you know, uh, unfortunately, that property movement has been sort of. Um, become sort of corporatized right, in the case of NPC. But uh, if it had gained a stronger sort of uh, support, right, uh, and, and if the if the funds were better managed, I think the one of the problems was that the, you know, the, when, when people get money then something some things happen. So this this I, I, I would have wished that the cooperative movement right uh, would have taken root and maybe uh, expressed in different forms including what we have today, uh, taking over certain places and uh, working towards certain uh, objectives and, and, and goals. Do you think the cooperative can start now? Like, is this the, the beginning of the cooperative? There, there are still 80, if you look at the cooperative site, there are still around 80 cooperatives. Uh, I'm still a card carrying member of the NUS co op, which I can get discounts. But there are, there are cooperatives. <laughs> Sorry? There are cooperatives. So I think. Um, is 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 um, can can it try right? Um, can we also do something um, you know like like what we are doing now on a different scale and also extend it to <coughs> different aspects, right? You, you, you can imagine you know um, in a in the kampongs various villages come together and say okay, you know collectively we we, we co collect all the mango uh, mangoes from the plants you know, and then sell it right uh, as as a collect uh, as a collect. Uh, uh, Co cooperative, so that that's um, that's actually something that we can we can think about because it's something that had happened in history. It's just that you know uh, not not a lot of people know about this idea of the cooperative. I think I would have to agree with what the first two speakers have shared. Um, definitely, for us in our business, of course, we prefer not to change. We would have preferred. The, the majority of the shareholder, um, the developer would give a facelift. We can bring back the the, the charm that uh, it was that we used to have. But of course, they have different agenda. You know, the time it really, as I said, is the end of an era. And uh, cooperative, I think that's a fantastic idea. And everyone, a lot of people, I mean, just look at what, what this place is today. But of course, we will always face a reality check of Real estate price is real estate in Singapore is just so challenging to to own rental and, and, and you know all these obstacles. So it's it's we were just uh, just chatting with Eddie. But where's you know where where's the next where's the next space after this? You know I don't know maybe maybe people spot. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think so. So it becomes like a a a, a pop up movement. Yeah, you know, I, I mean it's 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 nice. It's nice to have a, have a change and yeah. So in 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 our in our context, yes, we would prefer to have stay, but stay in the sense not not in the deteriorating condition, but it's it's more revival. Yeah. So just 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 to have a shout out to the organizers. Um, in in corporate, there were a lot of uh, there was a lot of cooperative housing estates. So if you walk travel along Fire Labor Road, you know there are also all these. Uh, government uh, housing and they were all sort of a name uh, after sort of a different quality and one of one of the roads is called Thrift Drive uh, Jalan Gotong Royal 
and those kinds of things. Right? So that's actually a, a remnant of history of, uh, of cooperative housing. Because at the time when the British were leaving, there weren't enough, uh, there were not enough uh, housing for, for you know, uh, local, local, uh, uh, local civil servants yeah, that were coming up. I guess Eddie, you have your next <laughs> address. <laughs> um, do we have any other questions? Some questions. Yes. Yeah. This is a quick question, Samantha. Try my luck. Do you, by any chance, got to document any of the units in peace mentioned? No. So unfortunately, um, we didn't. Um, which is a is a pity, you know, because you know when a building's gone, it's gone. Um, we're actually working on a book now that's on Guatemala complex, and it's it's basically the same spirit I was talking about, which is. When you find out that oh it's going on block, and you know the people are moving out, you, you rush in and try to like document everything, but there isn't like time to do every single thing. Yeah, thanks for the question. Uh, as I sh was sharing earlier, we used to have a unit in in Peace Mansion, so we couldn't co document anything, but I can probably share with you what what's so unique about the the residential homes on in the block here. So we had a unit on the twenty third floor. I, remember is it different yeah we had third floor and we we did stay in it we we rented it out and it was basically a, a prc um, tenant who rented it and they did it like what how the hong kongers do it in, in canton they call it tong bong basically they just divide it into you know how, how many uh, it was it was quite a decent decent size but they managed to the di divide up to maybe six seven rooms seven rooms so it, it was a very lucrative um, business for, for for the tenant and it was our unit was facing the picture very nice facing golden mount so it was fantastic view the only downside was the bedroom the bedroom had no proper windows all right because the bedroom the master bedroom was facing a very important side here Istana. So basically, although you have windows, you were actually hit with diagonally mm. ventilated concrete slabs, so you could not really see out. So it's that, that's the that was the only downside. Yeah. Can, can I just add a point that uh, <coughs> I just brought up? Um, so those those buildings that I showed you are really from the nineteen seventies, and it's really that era of buildings that are now uh, under threat. And the latest one that you might have read in the newspapers is uh, People's Park uh, Complex. Yeah. And People's Park Complex actually is not just important to Singapore, but in fact, it has this history that's now connected to uh, to the metabolism you know, sort of uh, period. You know, uh, and people like you know, architects like Renko have come in, you know, not, not Renko, but the, the Japanese metabolists have come in and said that you know, we've only dreamt about uh, these kinds of metabolism metabolic building but you guys have done it so in, so in fact some of the buildings in fact are not just uh, have histories that are important to us but also in the sort of the history of uh, global architecture and of course then the question is how what, what are we going to do about it as a, as, as, as a society as a, as, as, a, as, a, as a cooperative and as people who are you know, interested in maintaining you know, our, our legacies and our histories well, that actually provides us a very good note to point everyone to this slide. Um, so the organizers, well, not me, but Thrift, are putting together a digital sort of community response wall to Peace Centre in the final month of Peace Centre. Um, please do scan the QR code and share your memories if you have them. Thrift will also be here until the end of the month, um, and you're always welcome to pop in and talk to any of the folks on the Thrift team. Um, about some of the buildings that have been shared today, there is currently an exhibition that's ongoing at the NLB and the URA Centre called Dare to Dream. Um, and it covers some of the iconic buildings of Singapore history, as well as interviews with some of their architects, oral histories, etc. Um, she can holding up the flyers. We didn't coordinate this, by the way, but <laughs> he somehow just has everything in his bag. <laughs> so um, yes, do go and check out the exhibition um, and find out a little bit about that history as well. Um, this sort of brings us to the end of today's event, but the panelists, well, you can find them up here in front if there are any last lingering questions that you want to pose to them. Otherwise, join me in giving them one last round of applause, <laughs> as well as the first and second story. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks.